Coming up, things are hotting up at the park. There are embers flying everywhere. I visit an island rich in native wildlife. Each night, the little penguins come to shore. And white lines. Yes, they really do exist. Ah, hey. Look at the size of them already. You can see by the vegetation, a lot of understory, a lot of vegetation that's indicating to us that there hasn't been a fire here for at least 20 years. Yeah. If this goes up under a wildfire, it would have a massive impact on the park. Following the recent bushfires in New South Wales, I've invited the Rural Fire Service to reduce some of the potential hazards surrounding the park. Lots of things happen at the park, from heart attacks to snake bites. But there's one overriding thing that could cause us real damage, and it scares the heck out of me. It's fire. I'll get you to start burning on this edge. At the same time, I'll get the fellas to do some spot yeah. ignitions in there. Well, today's an important day. We've organised a backburning procedure, which is to light fire to a particular patch of bush out the back of the reptile park. We've got the Rural Fire Brigade here to help because it's a big area, uh, and we're burning it purely to make the park safer. Uh, fire control, this is reptile control over. Right, yeah, just advising you, we are now starting to burn over. There's a lot of fireys on the ground here, and they're a well-oiled machine. They know what they're doing, but if it was me, I'd be worried about this thing getting out of control, and I don't know how I'd stop it. Can I have those drip torches over here, please? Rolf Poole is leading the team from the Rural Fire Service, and his plan is to only burn the undergrowth. Hazard reductions or wildfires, it's fire, and fire is inherently dangerous. The rural fire guys are great. They know when there's a habitat tree with a big hollow, maybe a possum in there. I know this habitat's good for snakes, so that's what we're here for. And if anything comes out, I'm going to pounce on it. As the fire intensifies, it's my turn to jump into action. Come here. It's an eastern water dragon. Wild animals react in really different ways to different fires. If it's a really hot fire, sometimes they've got no chance to get out of it. But if it's a nice slow burn and they know it's coming, they'll try and get out of the way. Got a bit of a spot fire over here and a little flare up. That's going to get hot. Pretty soon, I've got another critter to rescue. I've just had a call from the boys. They've spotted a possum. I'm going to have to go and get him. This guy may end up being our first victim. I don't want that to happen. Oh, he's not going to be that easy to grab. I'm going to have a crack. This is why we only burn the undergrowth, so animals like possums and birds can escape up to the treetops. Would you mind just giving that tree just a light tap for us? If it goes up a little bit higher, I'd be happier. That's the good thing about a slow-moving fire, the wildlife. It's got time to get away. Or in this case, go up. That's, that's good. They'll have to stay up there till it's dark. While the firefighters do their work, I'm going to take the opportunity to hold a fire drill for our staff. Right, our guys. So whilst this is only a hazard reduction burn, we're going to treat it as if it's real. We've got flames in trees, smoke-filled air. It doesn't get any more real than this. You can see from here, the fire, it's just on the edge of the park. It's literally right there. No one's left out when it comes to evacuations. One by one, all the residents are coming with us. Come on, Danny, you come, you're coming for a little trip. You all right? Good girl, good girl. We might only have one chance at this. Good job. All right, good job. Come on. Come on, you're coming up the top. This is a bushfire. Now, that makes our building a safe house. So we take our animals there, we take our visitors there, and we take our staff there. We'll fill our gutters with water. It's safer in here than out in the bush. There you go, Cassie. Just down here. There you go, mate. You'll be right now. Anywhere in on the ground's OK. Air conditioner's on. Hello. With the animals safe, I'm sending Keeper Jimbo out to keep a watch on the fire zone. Everyone has a different role when the fire comes, and we all know what that role is. But for Jim, it's an important role. He's the man on the ground because he's our eyes and ears. He's the fellow that says, I've got a fire outbreak, and we draw our attention there. Really important. But when Jimbo gets to the fire zone, there's bad news. Go ahead, Jimbo. 
Picking up here, this fire's starting to get a little bit fierce. There's a few embers floating around. We might get a few spot fires on it. Yeah, OK, mate. I can see a lot of smoke. I'll round up the troops. Righto, see you soon. That's Bruni Island, and I'm heading there to see its wildlife. The place is intact, its ecosystems are alive. It's suffered a little at the hands of people, but not as much as other places. The feral pests, the habitat destruction, not so extensive, and the island and its wildlife are alive. Bruni is part of Tasmania and lies just south of its capital, Hobart. I'm here for 48 hours, and there's a few species I'm keen to see. That's an echidna. And what he's doing right now is why they're so successful. I'm on an island and there's no big predators here, so I'd expect to see a heap of echidnas. But even on mainland Tasmania and Australia, echidnas are successful because of this adaptation. He's buried in, used his strong legs to wedge himself down in the ground. Now, let's pretend I was on mainland and I'm a dingo. I cannot get through those spines. In Tasmania, a devil, I cannot get through those spines. They're perfectly equipped to protect themselves against almost any predators. It's time to get a move on. I've got a couple of hours before sundown and I need to set a trap. Don't worry, there's nothing gruesome. This one's purely the photographic kind. Tasmania is home to two species of quoll, the tiger quoll and the smaller eastern quoll, which is extinct back on the mainland. All right, this looks like a perfect spot. And what I'm hoping to see, or actually capture at night on this remote camera, is an eastern quoll. Now, an eastern quoll is a carnivorous marsupial related to the Tasmanian devil, but a bit smaller and really pretty. They were last seen there 50 years ago. But here in Tasmania, and especially on Bruni, they're common. Eastern quolls might be small and even cute, but they're still carnivorous. They'll eat anything from a small mammal, birds, reptiles, and insects. So what I've got here are some strips of chicken. Now this is within view of my camera, and I'm gonna rub that around a bit. They've got a brilliant sense of smell. And I'll leave a few bits. And hopefully, after dark, we're gonna see some quolls come in if they're in this area. All right, last one. Well, that's it. Let's hope we see some quolls. Now, I need to get somewhere. I'm on my way to the Neck. It's a stretch of land that connects the north and south parts of Bruni. It was formed through a process called deposition. Over time, the wind and sea have dumped tons of sand and sediment. And as it's built up, it's connected the two islands. Just in case you're wondering, the name for a spit connecting two land masses like this is an isthmus. Now I've come to this spot just on dark. And once it is dark, the species that I've come to see will arrive. But they're not nocturnal. They've both been out hunting all day. One is the short-tailed shearwater, and it's a pelagic seabird that flies just above the sea surface, looking for schools of bait fish. When it finds them, it dives in and catches its food. The other is the little penguin. They wait for dark because it's safer. They don't want to lead any potential predators to their chicks. And the reason they come here? Well, it's because the neck provides the perfect opportunity for the birds to burrow. Now, judging by the size of that, I reckon it's a shearwater. The penguin burrow would be a little bit bigger. And that'll be about a metre deep. They dig it, get down inside, lay their eggs, incubate the eggs, and they'll rear their chicks right until the point they can fly off themselves. It's quiet now, but in an hour or two, this place is going to be alive. There's a wildlife park not too far from Bruni, where I've been told there's a couple of new arrivals. I don't need to be asked twice when I get an invite to go see some rare exotics. These are white lions. They're not albinos. Their colour is caused by what's called a recessive gene. 
<laughs> These two are only 14 weeks old. <laughs> hey, look at the size of them already. <laughs> They're the first ever born in captivity in Tasmania. Mum Kiara and Dad Bakari were brought here as cubs in 2009. So to have a successful mating so soon is pretty special. The white lion is native to the Timbavadi region of South Africa, but it was extinct in the wild until a reintroduction a few years ago. 20 years of research by the White Lion Trust eventually led to a family of lions being introduced onto a protected reserve. There's still some concern amongst the scientific community regarding the reintroduction, mainly around whether the lions were too closely related. But apparently, since their reintroduction, they've been hunting and breeding successfully. Today, three prides roam free in the reserve, but they still need protecting. Their rarity means they are prized by hunters that visit game reserves next to the protected land owned by the White Lion Trust. But amongst Indigenous communities, they're regarded as sacred. In fact, they're known as the children of the sun god. It's so unfamiliar for me. I'm used to something the size of a devil, and at 14 weeks, they're already twice the size. Everything's big, the paws, the head. <laughs> when they lick your hand, their tongue is raspy, and it'll get rougher as they get older, just like their parents. It's like that so they can lick the bones of their prey clean. Today, there are more white lions in captivity than in the wild. So long as there are, little lions like these two can act as ambassadors for their kind and make people aware they actually exist in the wild. This is such an honour to be allowed to get up close to these incredible creatures. Here you go, mate. Maybe one day, I'll see their cousins in the wild. I'm back on Bruni Island, just south of Hobart. This spit of land is the neck, and at night, it comes to life. I can see groups of shearwaters starting to congregate just offshore. But like I said, they won't come on land until it's dark. As for the penguins, well, they're out there too, but they'll be a little more hidden in the water. I think once it's dark, I'll hear them before I see them. All that's left to do now is wait for the sun to go down when the action begins. The shearwaters are coming in thick now. There's hundreds just above my head, and they just soar on past. Now, they won't go down to their burrows until it's really dark. It's still dusk at the moment, and when they land, they come down with a crash. They might be elegant flyers at sea, but they're certainly not that on land. They're everywhere. Some of them come right down close. Here's one that's crash landed. It's been out feeding all day at sea. We'd have a belly full of fish that he's gonna drop down in there and regurgitate for the chicks. You know, you might think they're awake at sea all day, they're gonna come back here and sleep, but that's not what happens. They actually defend, just like you can hear there. They defend this little territory, and each nest is about a metre apart, and that's the little area that they defend. I'm gonna leave him be there down to his chicks. This is wildlife at its best. This hillside is just teeming with life. There are hundreds of shearwater nests right there. That's enough of the shearwaters. I can hear some other critters coming out of the water. I've no doubt who that'll be. Each night, the little penguins come to shore. Now, there were three that popped out of the water. Two have gone up to their burrows. And that was the third, there he goes. Off to feed his chicks. They may look a little cumbersome on land, but their speed and agility at sea will have helped him fill his belly, full of small fish, squid and krill. They'll dive down to 60 metres if they need to. Not surprising, since the scientific name for the little penguin is Udiptila minor, which translates to good little diver. Now, you might think that waddle would stop them venturing too far up the hillside, but that doesn't put these little fellas off. That's so great to see such a healthy population of two amazing bird species. But it's getting late. Time to hit the trail back to base. Good timing. 
That's definitely a koala head. A great sign. I hope that camera trap I said is doing its job. There's a lot of smoke up there. The tin. Go ahead, Jimbo. Pick it up here, this fire's starting to get a little bit fierce. There's a few embers floating around. We might get a few spot fires on it. Yeah, OK, mate, I can see a lot of smoke. I'll round up the troops now. Righto, see you soon. We're conducting a controlled burn just outside the park. But my man Jimbo's concerned it's drifting dangerously close. It may only be a hazard reduction burn, but it still has risk. If the wind changes or an ember carries, fire could jump and Reptile Park could be at risk. No more flame height than a metre, full stop. These boys are on alert. Yeah, Andrew, it's Frank. Don't light any more at the moment, mate. Uh, I'm going to have to relook at the plan with that wind change. There is a change coming later today, so we want to get the most of the burn done before that wind change occurs. Any swift change in any weather condition can mean a completely different fire behaviour. All right, just wait a minute and watch that wind for a moment. I want to see what she does. Just what we didn't want. The forecast is for a late change in the wind's direction. Oh, the wind's supposed to be coming from the northeast, it's sort of buggering up which way you want to do the burn. Just hold it there for a minute. The crews are having to work fast to protect the fence line. Uh, attention, all units, this is control. Just watch out for spotting. The wind has changed and moving towards the reptile park. Now, the fire is under control, but there are embers flying everywhere. So what I need to do now is call my park staff up. We need to just be inside here and make sure that one hot ember doesn't hit the ground and ignite. Can you just send one or two sentries in here just to keep an eye on this? Everything OK there? Shooting right, mate. Chris, what I'd like you to do, please, is just stay here. That's an old pile of browse, yep. and the fireys do not want that to go up. Okay. So please just stay here. If you even see a hot ember come down, call me or just grab one of them and tell them. Yep. OK? Good on you. Sweet. There are park staff in here, yeah. but I think just a couple of firefighters keep an eye on over there in particular. We'll just patrol the fence every now and then. You know, that fire's really going. The fire's intense and it's creating its own wind. The possibility of embers dropping into the park is really worrying me now. That's hot. We're at a distance and that's very uncomfortable for me. These guys are used to it and they're in and around it. That's scary. Mick's still up at pit six. The fire's just reached there. So he's going to hang around there for a few minutes and just check for spot fires. I'm going to keep an eye out over there. Pretty gnarly, eh? He's on the We've got approximately 25 firefighters on the ground here. Whilst the burn is not that big, uh, we need that many people because we are burning at a hotter part of the year. And because the fuels are a little bit drier, we want to just make sure we've got enough people on the ground. Fire comms, reptile park control. We're sleeping, go ahead, over. Yeah, roger. Yeah, we're calming it down now. I see that. Thank you. Fire comms, clean. Look all the way around and it's all in the clear. Excellent, thank you. Finally, the boys from the fire service are happy they've made the undergrowth safe. There were times where I was on edge today. The flames were high and embers were taking off. But in the end, I didn't need to worry. It all went like clockwork and the park's safer for it. The Australian native bushland is designed to burn. Many plant species won't actually re-sprout or germinate without fire. We've removed some of the habitat. We've created some new habitat for other wildlife in the future. So it's really part of the natural Australian cycle, and we, we need to learn how to live with bushfires. How'd we go, mate? Happy? Excellent. We've reduced the fuels. Uh, just in the mopping up phase now, it's all gone very well. You can see the fuel was basically up around our waist yeah. before. We've got rid of it. But that really is an indicator that when you least expect the fuel is that dry, it you know, really yeah. doesn't take much for it to burn. Because of the burn today, the park's now safe from fire for the next five to seven years. And for someone whose responsibility it is to look after the park, that's a big relief. <laughs> Hello, mate. There you go. I'm on Bruni Island just south of the Tasmanian capital, Hobart. All right, now it's early morning. I'm back to get the camera, hopefully with some quolls and who knows what else might be on there.
I can see the chicken's gone. Now, it might have been a currawong. I guess the proof will be in that camera. It's two quolls. Even though that's just on camera and not seeing them in the wild, that's a real achievement. Oh, there's a black one. Black eastern quolls, they're pretty rare. They're only found at a few spots in Tasmania. There's one here. And that's three quolls because there's been two fawn quolls, the normal colour, and one black in one little area. Even though the food's gone now, well, I think it's gone, they're still there just sniffing around. They've got a great sense of smell and they're drawn into that. The quolls are just so abundant and it's so good to see them. One of wildlife's anomalies lives down here on Bruni and I've just got to see it. This is a white wallaby. It's not albino. In fact, it's known as the painted wallaby as it's a few genes short of being pure albino. White wallabies are rare, but on an island where there's no predators, they're able to thrive. Under any normal circumstances, a wallaby like this has lost its camouflage. It stands out to predators, be that a wedge-tailed eagle, a devil, a dingo. But here, those predators just aren't about, and the wallabies have built up in numbers. This place is just impressive. It's got me thinking. It was a great night last night with the birds, but after seeing those images this morning of the quolls on the camera, I just had to get out for a spotlight and try and find some mammals. This is the track down to where I put the camera, and it is just brilliant. It should be like this on the mainland. It's amazing what a lack of introduced pests can do for an ecosystem. These eastern quolls, they're popping out everywhere. Remember, it's extinct on the mainland, so it's a real thrill to see them like this. And look at that, a white possum. The Bass Strait may well divide our country, but it does provide refuge to some of our native species. Bruni itself, well, the outlook looks good, just so long as feral pests that have done so much harm to the mainland's wildlife are kept at bay.